Now let's, let's say a little something about the Austrian school and how it works because this is free market economics 101. I want to give you an indication of how economics is supposed to go, how it's supposed to work, how it arrives at its conclusions. And I hope you'll find that it is actually a very impressive, elegant intellectual system. It's not boring. And the, the things it teaches are not arbitrary. They are, in fact, undeniably true. Now, Mises himself argued that what we do is we begin uh, in, in what he called praxeology, which is the science of human action. We begin with the fact, the so-called action axiom, the fact that human beings act. And by action he means that human beings aim at ends. They aim at, and when I say an end, I, I mean this in the philosophical sense of goals or purposes. That we are goal or purpose oriented in our action. And that when we employ the scarce means of this world in the pursuit of some end, what we are doing is trying to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory state of affairs. Mises used to say that all action is prompted by some felt uneasiness. And we act when we believe that by pursuing our action, we will be able to remove or alleviate this uneasiness. And that in the wake of the action, we will be better off than we would have been if we had not performed that action. Now that's not to say that we're, sometimes we're not, you know, we might not be mistaken. Sometimes you may think that, you know, this steak will taste better than it really will. You, you may make some type of mistake, but at least ex ante, uh, before you engage in the action, your assessment, uh, your appraisal, of the consequences of this action are that it will make you better off and remove this uneasiness uh, as opposed to what would have happened if you had not taken the action. Now it's impossible basically to refute this because if you were to say human beings don't act then you are in fact employing the scarce means of your vocal cords and your brain in order to pursue the end of trying to prove that nobody pursues ends basically so you'd be contradicting yourself. So we have this axiom human beings act and what follows from this are important implications for economics, believe it or not. We can, we can see that are contained in the very implication of, of uh, in the very existence of human action. We can see that there are certain things implied. Um, when I act, I am choosing things. The, world, the, the resources in this world are scarce. That is to say, they cannot possibly fulfill every conceivable end I may wish to pursue. And even if all goods existed in superabundance such that as soon as I desired them, I could instantly acquire them in whatever quantities I wanted. Even if we lived in that world, I would still have to make choices because I would still be confronted with the scarcity of time and the scarcity of my own body. I cannot, in the nature of things, simultaneously fulfill all the ends I may wish to pursue. So even if all the physical means in this world were instantaneously available to me in superabundance, I would still have to choose which one do I want to pursue now, which one do I want to pursue later. So the very fact of choice uh, implies the existence of costs. Because when I do one thing, I necessarily set aside the opportunity to do a different thing. As I say, I cannot fulfill all potential goals simultaneously. That's not, it's not possible given the nature of the world. So I have to have a ranking, an implicit ranking in my mind of all the ends I may wish to pursue. And so therefore, when I act, I choose the most valued end on my value scale, and I pursue that value. But there is a cost involved in pursuing that action. And the cost is the second most highly valued end. That is to say, the end that I would have pursued if I hadn't pursued the first one. So I might have had a ham sandwich if I hadn't had the turkey sandwich. So there is some cost involved. And that is the action that is necessarily foregone. So given that I possess a value scale, we can also derive from this in effect, the law of demand, or we can, in fact, before we even go to the law of demand, the law of diminishing marginal utility. Now, this seems very technical, but it's actually not difficult to understand. This law simply tells us that the utility of each additional unit of a good decreases as the supply of units increases. And what that means simply is this. Let's suppose I have four units of water. I have a value scale that tells me how I'm going to allocate these units of water. The first unit of water I may want to apply to drinking. The second to bathing. 
the third to watering my plants, and the fourth to washing my car. That's my value scale. And you can see me, you can see that this value scale exists by observing my action. That my first priority is to drink. Well, let's suppose I lost one of these units of water, or for some reason I could acquire only three units. Does that mean that this week I'll just say, well, guess I can't drink this week? Well, of course, obviously I'll still drink with the remaining water, but I will go without the least valued end that I could have pursued if I had had that fourth unit, namely the washing of my car. I'll go without that. And so what this implies then, this, this, the existence of this value scale, is that the increment of satisfaction that I derive from each additional unit of a good becomes smaller and smaller because with each additional unit of a good, I'm applying that good to a less urgently, less highly valued end on my value scale. So the first one for drinking is obviously of very great importance to me. I derive a great increment of satisfaction from having that unit of water as opposed to having zero units. But then the unit that I acquire for bathing, well, okay, the increment is, is somewhat smaller. Bathing for me is a less valued end than drinking. So this is in fact the law of diminishing marginal utility. And to derive this law, it is not necessary to introduce um, concepts of, of um, psychological or physiological satiety. It doesn't mean that you know, I, I get full when I eat a lot of ice cream, or I get full when I drink a lot of water, or psychologically I only want this or that. It's implied in the very existence of human action that we have, as we've seen, that we have costs, we have value scales, and that therefore, because on our value scales we always pursue the most highest, the, the highest valued end, any additional ends that we can fulfill with an increasing supply of a good will be applied to less valued ends and hence we have the idea that the utility that we acquire from each additional good is going to be less and less over time. Well this is just simply an implication of human action. There's no need to go out and test this theory. There's no need to interview people psychologically. It follows necessarily from the concept of action. And now that we've taken all this that, that seems obvious to people, we think, oh yeah, of course I, I realize all this. But to spell it out is very important because it has implications for economics. And that is, now I'm going to stray a bit, straying, straying. We're out here now in no man's land with no microphone. And that is that you can put up here this sort of thing you see in any old, you know, even a high school textbook. We can, we can derive the existence of a demand curve. Now this is price, quantity here, and quantity here of a given good. So let's say, uh, you know, how, how is it that I, what, what, what does this mean? What this means is that as, as, uh, as the price of a, of, a, uh, of a good goes up, do, 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 the amount of it that I will typically demand will be lower and lower. Now, but why, why is that? Why would that be? Is this just an arbitrary construct of economists? Well, it follows from what I just said, that as I acquire additional units of a good, I am necessarily going to be applying them to less and less valued ends. And so therefore, I'm going to be willing to part with less in order to acquire additional units as a good. So in order for me to be willing to acquire more, to go out farther this way on the x-axis, the price is going to have to be correspondingly lower in order, to, in order for me to be interested. Because at this point, when I acquire additional units of the good, I'm going to be you know, applying them to very, very uh, minimal ends on my, on my value scale. So this fact, this, this existence of this law of marginal utility, in fact, implies that we have a demand curve on the part of consumers that is downward sloping to the right. There's no reason to assume, by the way, that it's perfectly straight. This is, it could be jagged. But the idea is that it moves downward because uh, we're only willing to acquire additional quantities at lower prices. For this reason, so again, this is not arbitrary. There's nothing arbitrary about this. Now, I'm going to return to that a little later to, sh to show how, how it can be used. But this is really just giving graphical representation to something that we can understand just through normal speech without, without the use of mathematics. So all of this stuff just follows from the existence of human action. Again, we, have a, we don't go out and interview people. We don't, this is totally unnecessary. It, it, is, it is a necessary consequence of how human action is. Uh, the